Welcome to today's Bible study with Pastor Josh Tice. The next time you're in Las Vegas, we'd love to meet you in person at Southern Hills. If you happen to watch us regularly, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and consider sharing this video with a friend. You can support the ministries of Southern Hills by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn how the Bible is relevant in your life today. And you made it back to Southern Hills. Give yourself a round of applause. You did it. You made it. We're glad you're here today, the Sunday after Easter. Everybody comes to church on Easter, but you came the Sunday after Easter, which makes you better than all of those other people. So, congrats. No, that's a terrible thing to say. We are glad you're here, though. We're going to have a great time in the study of the Word of God. Today, we begin a brand new sermon series entitled Upside Down Kingdom. It is a three-week sermon series that teaches us how to live right side up in an upside down world. Right side up in an upside down world. Have you realized lately that the world is a little bit off kilter, a little bit upside down, a little bit out there, a little bit strange. How many of you agree with me? The world is not necessarily on the right course. Can I get an amen? Okay, so what do we do? And the answer to that question is found in the teachings of Jesus. You see, Jesus went up on a mountaintop one day on a flat plain on that mountain, and he taught his disciples how to live as followers of Jesus in a world that is really corrupted. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, and it's what we're going to be studying over the next three weeks from the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 6, verses 20 all the way to verse 49. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, Luke, chapter number 6, verse 20 and following. If you didn't bring a Bible today, that's okay. Most of our scripture is going to be on the screen, but I do want you to have a Bible. And if you stop by and say hi to me on the way out, I'll give you a free copy of a physical copy of the Bible. Just stop on by and say hi. Uh, and I need a Bible and I'll give it to you. Sermon number one in this sermon series is entitled, The Upside Down. How to live in the upside down. Let's pray. Father God, my prayer is very simple today. I need help to help my friends. Now, God, you wrote this so many years ago. You gave it to us because you were the one who taught your disciples. And then those disciples taught others and wrote these scriptures so that we could see what your sermon was all about. Now I pray that you'd help us to understand it for our lives. I pray that we would see how we can live differently in a world that is very divided. How we can live loving in a world that is very, very angry. How we can help people, Father, as you help people. We can show mercy, love, peace, joy. I pray that you would give us this understanding today as we study your word. Holy Spirit of God, fill this place with your presence, just as you have filled it with your people, and fill me with your word and your power to help your team. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, you've pressed reset. You've started over. You've begun a new journey with Jesus Christ. That's what last week's sermon on Easter was all about restarting everything. And I'm glad you did. You say, well, where do I go from here? Well, restarting a relationship with Jesus Christ, resetting your life to walk with him like never before, there's specific rules to understand going forward that are going to be a great help to you because you've really entered a new relationship. You've entered a new kingdom, as it were. It's no different than when I first got married. Any married people in the room today? If you're married, give me an amen or a oh my. Either one will be sufficient. Uh, if you're married here today, you know that there are certain rules to marriage. I did not know this before getting married. If you're not married, you're going to hear some rules about marriage before you get into marriage, okay? For example, lots of rules. I'm just going to talk about uh, how you fight as a couple. Here, sir, you need to understand this. There are rules about marriage, and here's one of the rules. When you fight as a, as a couple, this is how it works. I found this out when I got married. When Josh and Heather are fighting, this is what happens. When Josh and Heather fight, let's see what happens. When Josh and Heather fight, let's go press that. When I'm wrong and she's right, the result is, well, Heather's right. That makes sense, right? It's simple, right? But that's not the end of the rules. Here's the next rule. When I'm right and Heather is right, occasionally happens, well, Heather's still right. Heather's right. That's the result. The next step is when I'm right and she's wrong, which is rare if ever, well, Heather's still right. That's, that's how the rule works. And the last rule I've learned is this, is that when I'm wrong and she's wrong, 
Well, that just means that Josh is wrong. That's how that works. So these are the rules of marriage. Just some of the rules. I won't give them all to you because today's not about marriage or family. It's to illustrate the fact that when you enter a new relationship, there are certain things that you should know about how it works. If you are a follower of God, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you're not only part of a new family, you're part of a new kingdom. Jesus is not only your savior, well, God is your father. You understand? And not only is that he your savior, he's your Lord and your king, and you're now part of a new kingdom. So the question then today is this, if Jesus Christ is developing in the gospel of Luke, all of these relationships with these new disciples, he sits them down to teach them what it's like to live in this new kingdom. Living upside down, or living right side up in an upside down world. To live in an upside down, uh, to live in the upside down, you must forget everything you think you know. The reason why some of us as Christians are gonna have a very difficult time being Christians is because you still think like they think rather than thinking like God thinks. Listen to me, listen. The reason why many of you will have a difficult time being a Christian is because you came from the world and you're now part of a new kingdom and you think like they think and you don't think like he thinks. This Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus Christ explains how he thinks. What are the laws of the upside down kingdom? Well, Jesus gave them in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, which took place literally on a hillside. In fact, it took place uh, in this location. This photograph will show you. It's, it's called the Hillsides of Galilee. And, uh, and you can go there to this day on the west side of the Galilee. If you travel to Israel with me someday, I'm going to be taking a trip with the church at the, the end of 2023. And if you want to go, this is one of the places we go. We travel there. We go to the hillsides. And as you can see, these hillsides allow you a beautiful view of the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus gathered his disciples. But it wasn't just his 10 disciples that day. We learn from the Gospel of Matthew and Luke that Jesus gathered not hundreds but thousands of people around on this hillside and they sat down in groups all around this big plain. And as Jesus sat down, he gave a sermon. The sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount. It really has been referred to as the Christian Manifesto, the way Christians are supposed to live in the world in which they find themselves. And today, as I said, we start three weeks as we work through this study, and Jesus gives these laws of the upside down kingdom. The first law that he gives, and this is the first point of today's sermon, is that temporary things don't matter. For us, for us, for those of us in the kingdom, temporary things don't matter. I'm going to say number one, you say temporary things don't matter. Number one, temporary things don't matter. Say it again. Temporary things don't, come on, say it again, say it again. Temporary things don't matter. They don't matter. And Jesus illustrates this by bringing up four very specific things that are temporary that seem to matter a lot, but they don't. Money is one of them. Popularity is another. Fame is another. Food is another. Let's go ahead and see exactly what he talks about. Look at verses 20 through 26. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's weird. That's a weird way to start a sermon. Happy are poor people, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says. You say, I didn't think that's true. I mean, I thought rich people were happy and poor people were sad. Isn't that the way it works? Well, see, in the upside down world in which we live, this crazy, mistaken, broken world, we think differently than the rest of the world. And Jesus said, I want you to understand, actually, happy are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. He said, I want you to understand, it's actually, you're happy if you're hungry, not full. See, this makes no sense to me, Pastor. That's because we think like them and not like him. Jesus is saying, you're actually happy if you're poor and hungry. You say, ah, that's good. I'm, that's a good thing to believe as a Christian. I believe I'm happier if I'm poor and hungry. Sure. Amen. I'll put it on Facebook, but then I'm going to go fill my bank account and fill my stomach. You know what I mean? Because I've been hungry before, and I, it's not fun. And I've been poor before, and it's not fun. But Jesus says the opposite. It's so weird, but he goes on. Even more weird stuff that Jesus says. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh eventually. 
He says, you're happy when you're crying. Now, some of you are very melancholy people. You're like, I get it. I love being God. No, okay. It's not. He's saying, like, blessed are you, happy are you when you're truly filled with sorrow. But I don't like being poor, sorrowful, and hungry. It goes on. Blessed are you when men hate you. Nobody likes to be hated. I, I know some of you are like, I don't care what people think. Have you noticed that the people who often say, I don't care what people think, are the people who often care most about what people think? Amen. Yeah, it's true. You say, I don't want to be hated. Nobody wants to be hated, but Jesus said, blessed are you if you're, being, if you're hated, when you are excluded. I don't like to be excluded. I like to be included. When people revile you, I don't like to be reviled. I like to, I like to be loved and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He says, you're actually a blessed person if people hate you simply because you follow me. Verse 23. Right, uh, look at verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Rejoice in what day? He says, I want you to smile and I want you to jump and be like, yes, people hate me today. Why do they hate me? Well, because they hate me because I follow Jesus. And he says, look at what goes on. He says, for indeed, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner, their fathers did also hate the prophets. He said, if people hate you because you've done the right thing, you're just like your heroes. Now, these people's heroes were people like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. They were like, these are the best people. Well, think about the heroes that you have. A lot of them that have lived before, they went through te de terrible difficulty because they were hated. Isaiah was sawn in half because he was a follower of God and preached the Bible. Jeremiah was thrown into a dungeon and into the pit of the dungeon. It was raining and he sunk down into the mire and the clay. They pulled him out of it and stoned him to death. They took Daniel, one of the great heroes of these people, and they threw him in a lion's den to be eaten alive, but God saved him out of it. This is, these people were hated. And so what Jesus is saying is this, if you follow me, understand, you're going to be hated by association because they hate me. And that's actually okay. Popularity is not that big of a deal. That's his point. Now, he's going to give you the flip side of it. Look at verse 24 through 26. But woe to you or sadness upon the individual who is rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you who are full, for you shall be hungry. Woe unto you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so they did the fathers and the false pro to the false prophets. Jesus, in just a few words, friend, tells us that the most important things that you consider important in life are actually not that important at all. He, what, what is, he talks about money. He talks about food. He talks about laughter. And he talks about popularity. These are the four things humans spend most of their time going after. We spend our life focused on these things. How can I get more money? How can I feed my belly today? How can I have some joy and laugh? I don't want to cry. Happiness, happiness, happiness all the time. How can I ha have people like me? Oh, I want to be popular. Everybody like me. Everybody look at me. Make sure everybody loves me. And Jesus is saying, these four things are not that important. By the way, what do all four of these things have in common? You know what, the, what they have in common? All of them are fleeting. They're temporary. You have them in a moment, and then they're gone. Money. Ha is it true of you? Have you ever had a time in your mi life when you had some money? And you're like, where did the money go? You ever look in your bank account and say, where? You're like Captain Jack Sparrow, right? The rum is always gone. The money is always gone. Like, where'd it go? Where'd the money go? Well, the Bible tells you where the money went. Proverbs tells you that money sprouts wings and flies away. Money is temporary. But we spend our entire life pursuing money, and even though it's temporary. Food is temporary. The Bible also tells us we spend our life going after food, then we eat it, then we digest it, and it gets flushed away. Excuse the graphic nature of what I've stated, but that's exactly what the scriptures are teaching. You spend your life, what can I eat next? What can I eat next? What can I eat next? And then you fill your belly, and then it's gone. It's temporary. Laughter is temporary. We know laughter is temporary because we actually can enjoy the moment and hold deep sorrow in our hearts that we're hiding from everybody while we mask up with a smile. See, everybody's gotten rid of their masks, but most Christians still have theirs firmly planted on their face. I'm just going to smile and laugh and everything's okay. And, and we understand that true laughter is just fleeting. It's gone. Popularity. It's amazing how popular and loved you can be in our world, and then a day later you can be hated by everybody. 
Isn't that true? Yes or no? So what Jesus is saying is, friend, if you're my follower, if you're part of this new kingdom, you have to understand something. Don't spend your life like they spend their life, seeking after temporary things that are just gone. I love you. I love you. As a, listen, as your pastor, I love you. But my dear Las Vegas friends, I love you. But we are really messed up people because this is exactly what we seek after. Money, food, pleasure for the moment, popularity. And we race after it, and we race after it, and we race after it. And what God is saying to us is stop trying to go after the temporary when you are part of an eternal kingdom that will last forever. Can I get an amen? Temporary things, they go away. Where is your focus? Where is your focus? Where is your focus? Kingdom people are not to be obsessed with temporal things, but eternal matters. You have a good Easter? Everybody have a good Easter? Did you have a good Easter? How many of you did the hiding of the eggs? You, you hid your eggs with grandkids or your little kids or nephews and nieces. How many of you did the egg hunts? How many of you did some of that? Okay, some of you did. So we used to do it every year. My kids would not just do um, uh, uh, the plastic eggs, you know, with the stuff inside, but they did old school. They like to get the eggs and then hard boil them paint them. Anybody dye eggs? Anybody? How many of you have done that this year? You, you dye eggs? So we did it every year. For years we did it. But my youngest, Scarlett, is now 13, so she's, you know, she's too old for it now. Savannah's too old. Jonathan's in college. He's not interested in dyeing eggs. <laughs> They're just growing up, moving on. You guys want to dye eggs? No. Too cool for school, and I'm sick of them. I'm in that weird phase where I'm like, okay, how many years till I get grandkids? You know what I mean? Like, I want to have some fun again because my kids are too cool for everything. And we did it for years, for years. We would get the eggs, we'd hard boil them, we'd dye them, we'd paint them, and the kids would put them out there. We'd put them out in the little yard, and they were cute, and they'd go out there, and they'd find a little egg, and they'd find the... Now, when I was a kid, you'd find the egg, and we would crack it open, and you would eat it. You would eat an egg. But my children, for whatever reason, no. Why would we do that when we have candy, right? And so they would gather the eggs, and then they wanted to open up the carton and put the eggs back in the carton and put the, close the carton and put the eggs in the refrigerator to save them because they painted them. Well, first of all, they're ugly. You know, the kids, they, they're not good at this. No, I'm not being mean. Like, they don't know what they're doing. It's terrible children art. You have children art too. You pretend. If you're a child here today and you're like, I thought my parents, they're pretending. They don't like what you did. <laughs> it's going to get thrown away. And so these kids, they paint these eggs and then they want to save them. And they want to save them not just for the art. They want to save it because they want to do it tomorrow. Can we do this tomorrow? It's not Easter tomorrow. But can we? Okay. So we do it again. And then we do it again. But then we do it for two or three days. And the more we do it, the more the eggs get cracked and crumbly. It's gross. And I'm a throwaway guy, which means I like, I like order, I like neatness, I like simplicity. Throwaway stuff, I'm not sentimental. My wife, on the other hand, a little bit sentimental. She doesn't mind keeping it around for a little bit of time. So, she, so we, because I'm always, uh, she's always right, we decide to close the box and put it in the refrigerator. And for weeks, for weeks, every year, Mike, every year, for weeks, inside of my refrigerator is a carton of colored eggs. And every week, I could tell they get more crumbly and more de de degraded, and they just start to smell. And I try to throw them away, and the kids won't have it. So the last year, you know what I did? I, brilliant idea. I'm like, we're going to make sure that these things last forever. So what I did is I took all of those eggs to a local jewelry store, and I got a jeweler to take these eggs, and the first thing he did was he took these eggs, and I said, what do you want? He said, I said, I want them to last forever. I said, okay. So he took these, and he dipped them in lacquer and then a sealant, and then on top of that, he began to coat them with copper, silver, gold, and platinum. It cost me $742,000. However, no, but it's not a big deal. $742,000, but I have a dozen eggs and all of them beautiful, and we can go hunting anytime we want. How awesome is that? How many of you in this room believe that story is true? Raise your hand. Nobody, nobody. One person, one person. It's sad, it's sad. 
How many of you say that? There's no way you would do that. How many of you say there's no way? Do you know why there's no way I would do that? Here's why. Because what kind of a fool would spend their entire money and focus and life and energy and effort on something that's supposed to be temporary? It's only supposed to last a few days and then it's gone. Yet Christians, this is what we do. You know what our eggs are? Money. Food. Popularity. Laughter. Pleasure in the moment. We seek after it. We seek after it. We seek after it. We try to make it eternal. Last as long as possible. And God is saying, what are you doing? It all is going to get thrown away anyway. You are a member of the kingdom, which you, means you live upside down. Right side up in an upside down world. You don't live like them. You don't think like them. Number one, the first thing we rule we see is temporary things just don't matter. The kingdom people are not obsessed with temporal but eternal matters. Number two, second thing we learn from this passage is we win through love and generosity. Christians win through love and generosity. We win through love and generosity. Say it with me. We win through love and generosity. Say it again, say it again. We win through love and generosity. One more time, one more time. We win through love and generosity. This is how we win. See, I thought we win through evil, hate, and taking things. No, no, no. That's the way they fight. That's not how we fight. We fight by loving people. We fight by giving to people. See, I don't think I buy into that. Well, let's look at what Jesus says. Verse 27. But I say to you who hear, and there are only those who will actually hear what Jesus is saying, love your enemies. Say, say it with me, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. You have people who, who don't like you. I know some of you are shocked. Me? Does it shock any of you that even Josh has people, even, pa- even Pastor Josh has people who don't, doesn't like him? I'm going to say that again, and you give the appropriate response. <gasps> Because it is shocking. Like, I look in the mirror, I'm like, what's not to like? You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) it's a great guy. But there are even people that don't like me. I'm going to say it again. There are even people that don't like Pastor Josh. I know. It's shocking. And there are people that don't like you. (laughs) We're not as shocked. Every one of us have enemies. Now listen, this is amazing. Even if you don't consider them an enemy, they might consider you an enemy. Your competition for some reason. You have enemies. You know what the Bible says to do with your enemies? Love them. How am I going to win them by loving them? It's actually the only way you can win them. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Has it ever occurred to you that God loves those who hate you? Isn't that crazy? He doesn't love that they hate you, but he does love those that hate you. He loves them. He loves them, which means he loves them as much as he loves you, which means he doesn't want you to hate them even though they hate you. You're not supposed to hate them. You're supposed to love them because he loves them. You say, but they hate me. That's okay. Love those that hate you. Do good to those who hurt you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Now, now, let me stop and say this. I am not talking about an abusive person in your life who is physically, emotionally, sexually abusive. Hear me. Those people need to be reported to the authorities, and you need to protect yourself. Sometimes these passages have been taken and actually encourage, unfortunately, bastardizing the teaching of Jesus and encouraging people to stay in abusive situations. That's not what this is talking about. What it's talking about is in most interpersonal relationships, when somebody is not treating you well, you have a responsibility to treat them well. That's what it's saying. Now look at verse 29. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer him the other. Look, pal, you're at work, and some guy comes up to you and smacks you on the cheek. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to. You know what we're supposed to do? (laughs) Yeah, what are you supposed to do, all right? Let's ask Chris Rock. I'm just kidding. All right, very good. How could I not? How could I? 
how could I not, how could I, how, I'm, I'm just a human, I'm just a man. I don't, somebody's gonna start walking up right now. <laughs> this is where we get the famous phrase uh, where Jesus says, turn the other cheek. He, he's saying in general in life, if somebody hurts you, turn to the other cheek and say, fine, that's fine. You can mistreat me. I don't mind being mistreated because this is how we win. This is how we win. You say, man, this is hard to get through my mind. Here's why it's hard to get through your mind and my mind. It's because we've lived most of our life in their kingdom, not his kingdom. We've spent most of our life living by their rules, not his rules. So it says, turn the other cheek. And from him who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. That is, if somebody comes and says, that is a nice coat. You're like, you like my coat? You want my shirt too? You, get, you give them everything. You give them, this is where we get the phrase, giving them the shirt off your back. This is literally uh, our best understanding. By the way, you say, man, I, I, if I live this way, I'm telling you, people will take advantage of me. I know. Listen to me, Christian. I know. I was, uh, <laughs> I was preaching years ago um, in the Gospels where it says, it's better to give than to receive. You know, Caesar, where it says, it's better to give than to receive. And I'm preaching. I don't know, it doesn't make sense, but the Bible says it's better to give than to receive. You're actually happier when you give than when you receive. Like at Christmas time, when you give a gift, it's more joyful than even receiving a gift. Isn't it wonderful? And everybody, hey, man. After the service, is true. After the service, I had somebody come to me. And I, I'd only met him like a few weeks before, brand new visiting family. And he came up to me. He said, hey, pastor. He said, do you really mean that about it's better to give than receive? And I said, absolutely. I believe it. It's in the Bible. He said, oh, he said, that's good. He said, I want to be a blessing to you. This is a hand of God, true story. And I said to him, uh, I said, yeah? He said, yeah. He said, I'm actually kind of in need of some money. Can you give me whatever you have? <laughs> now, this was not like a church member, a longtime friend, somebody who I knew, just some random guy who heard the sermon. And I never carry cash. I never carry cash. I just don't, probably for this reason. You know what I mean? <laughs> and for whatever reason, I had a $100 bill in my pocket that day. And I don't remember why. I don't remember the circumstances. I never do. But I, I remember, I remember he, and I, I'm like, he said, do you have any cash? And I said, <laughs> and he looked at me, and, the, he, and he, he said, I just want you to be a blessed, I just want you to be blessed. He's, and I said, yeah, I actually have a hundred dollar bill. I thought he was going to try to make a point and be funny. And he said, can I have it? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's true. He's, and I thought the whole time, I'm like, oh, he's going to stop and try to make his point. And he's like, thank you. He took the $100 bill, walked out of the church, never saw him again. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you say, is the scripture true? Yeah, the scripture is true when it says more blessed to give than receive. And the scripture is true that we're supposed to be taken advantage of as followers of Christ. And they're going to be sometimes you never get it back. You never get it back. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Why? Because you can use it as a funny story later on, like I just did, right? <laughs> the point is, those who live in the kingdom, who follow the king, we don't mind being taken advantage of occasionally. Here's why. Because he was taken advantage of. I don't want people stomping all over me, stomping all over you like they did Christ. taking advantage of you like they did Christ, mocking you like they mocked Christ. Are we followers of Jesus or are we not followers of Jesus? We are. So look at what it says in verse 30. Give to everyone who asks you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Some of you are like, that neighbor of mine six months ago took my... <laughs> like you hate him inside. He doesn't even remember taking your rake, and he's going to come ask for your shovel, Right? And you're going to be like, you stupid in your mind. And then it comes Easter time next year, and you're like, I should invite him to church. You're like, not that neighbor. He can go to hell. I'm going to invite this one over here. <laughs> right? Now, well, you won't say it out loud, Pastor. I can't believe you said that out loud. Oh, oh. But you think it. You think it, which is worse. <laughs> now, nah, maybe saying it out loud is worse. All right, look what it goes on. Verse 31. And just as you want them to do to you, you also do to them likewise. The golden rule. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Christian who lives in the kingdom under the king needs to take, needs to care for people the way you desire to be cared for. 
But I do love people. I do. Pastor Josh, you make it. I do love people. Look at, verse 30, uh, look at verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? I do love people. All the people who love me, I love them right back. So what? Even sinners love those who love them. You're not acting like Jesus just because you love your kids. You're not acting like Jesus because you like your friends. You're not acting like Jesus when you show love to people who already agree with you on everything. You're acting like Jesus when you love people who hate you. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that for you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those who ha- who, uh, of whom have no, no hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive much back. His point is, you are my people. You're to be different than everybody else. Don't think like them. Don't act like them. Think like him. Act like him. Now, I need to break and give a caveat here because there's been a misinterpretation of this passage many times. When it's talking about turning the other cheek and loving those who hate you, we're talking about interpersonal relationships, not international diplomacy. What I just said is important. Did you grasp it? Why why is that important? Some people have said uh, international diplomacy, right? Like somebody's coming in, you have a tyrant and he's going to come and attack you and he's going to destroy your helm and your business and he's going to they blow up your capital, and Christians are like, we should just turn the other cheek. Please blow up our next building. Is that what we're supposed to do? This is not talking about international affairs. It's talking about interpersonal relationships. If you want to know how international affairs are to be dealt with, Romans chapter 13 explains that the government holds the sword for a purpose, and the sword is there to bring physical violence upon those who would hurt innocent people. Do you understand? right? Governments are not supposed to turn the other cheek. People are supposed to turn the other cheek. Do you see the difference? Can I get an amen? You say, what does that have to do with the sermon? Nothing, but all the time this is interpreted this way. This is not what it's talking about. It's talking about interpersonal relationships. And in our interpersonal relationships, we have to understand this is how we are peculiar. Listen, hear me, hear me, especially those of you who grew up extremely religious. If you grew up Baptist or you grew up a Presbyterian, or Pentecostal, or Assembly of God, or Church of Christ, or if you grew up in a charismatic church, or if you grew up extremely Methodist, or you grew up a Catholic or Mormon, there's this idea that Christians are to be peculiar. It's true, we are to be peculiar. That is different. But so many people, if you grew up Amish, or you grew up Mennonite, there's this concept that we're supposed to be extremely peculiar in like how we act or how we dress right? Like we walk around and we're just weird, you know what I mean? Like, what's wrong with you? I'm a Christian, that's what's wrong with me. I'm a peculiar person. I'm supposed to be the weirdest person inside of this whole building. No. The answer isn't that you're peculiar in how you dress. The answer is you're peculiar in how you respond, in how you react, See, you act differently and react differently than they do. When somebody hurts you, you love them. When somebody hates you, you help them. When somebody tears you apart, you do whatever you can to build them up. You're different in the way you love. You're different in the way you have joy. You're different in the way you have peace. You're different in the way you're patient with people. You're different in the way you show gentleness toward people. You're different in the way you're filled with the Spirit, and so you have temperance and self-control and goodness rather than evil. This is how we are to be peculiar. This is how we make a difference. Not such puny little things like what you might put on in the morning. This is how we win through love and generosity. So what are these laws in this upside down kingdom, Pastor Josh? There are many that he goes through, but in this sermon we have three. Number one, temporary things don't matter. Number two, we win through love and generosity. Number three, number three, and it all leads to this point, priority number one, rep the Father. I'm going to say, I want you to say it with me. Priority number one, rep the the Father. Say it with me. Say it with me. Priority number one, rep the Father. As a kingdom individual, as a follower of Jesus Christ the King, you have one singular priority. Here it is. Here it is. 
rep the Father. In your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your city, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You are a representative of God the Father. Everything in this passage, everything in a sermon leads to this point. Look what it says in verse 35. But love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Don't you see the point? The point is if you do this differently, and you live differently, and you react differently, you will be what? You'll be a child of God. It's not saying that you become a child of God. We understand. The Bible tells us in Romans, you become a child of God through belief in Jesus, receiving him as your savior. What it's saying is, you'll be acting like your father in heaven if you rep him the way he wants to be repped. He goes on, look, it says, therefore be merciful to people just as your father in heaven is also merciful. Okay, mercy of God, mercy of God. Question for you. Is there anybody here in this room who has ever received mercy from God? Like God should have got you, but he let you get away. Like maybe there's two of us. How many of you in this room have experienced the mercy of God? Would you say amen or raise your hand? Most of us. Some of you are like, not me. I don't need God's mercy because I am more godly than all. You're going to split hell wide open with that kind of pride. You have received mercy from God. That is, you've sinned, you deserve to go to hell, but God, through grace, offers you salvation. Anybody here ever received the forgiveness of God? You ever go to God and be like, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm, I'm really sorry, God, I'm sorry, I really, oh, I screwed up again, God, I'm so sorry, God, I'm so sorry, God, 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 I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me one more time, just one more time? I'm good after this, I promise. <laughs> Anybody here ever received forgiveness from God? More than once. Anybody? Raise your hand. All right, yeah, most of us. Not me, I don't need forgiveness. I know you're so much better than the rest of the world. Anybody here ever receive love from God? Anybody here ever receive love from God? If that's you, raise your hand or say amen. Sure. So here's the point. You have so much love, you have so much mercy, you have so much forgiveness. He is rich with love, mercy, and forgiveness, gives you as much as you want. You are now rich. We, the fam, right? We, the family of God. He, our Father. We, the family. We are so stupid, stinking, filthy, rich with mercy, love, and forgiveness. We got so much, we don't even know what we can do with it all. See, I don't have a lot of money. You got, what's, you got what the rest of the world doesn't have. Love, mercy, and forgiveness. You have more than you could ever spend. So you should give it away. My mother was a couponer. Anybody a couponer? Anybody couponer? All right, very good. I'm still a couponer. All my coupons are on the app. I'm the guy at Cafe Rio who's like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. How do I, how do I put the coupon? Or at Subway. You remember the Subway used to have the little stamps? You know what I mean? And now the Subway app, it doesn't work, and they know it doesn't work. It drives me nuts. My, I got that from my mother. My mother was a couponer, and she had those coupon books. We had tons of coupons in the different categories, and she knew what double coupons and triple coupons were. How many of you know what triple coupon day was? You remember triple coupon day? Some of you youngsters, you have missed out on some of the glory days of America. I'll tell you that right now. You really have. There was double or triple coupon day, which means you could take your coupon in on triple coupon day, and you would get triple off whatever the number was. And you could game the system, baby. There were days in which you could go in and find certain products for just pennies on the dollar, like literally. And my mother was one of these people. She would walk into the Lucky's. Thank you. Thank you. You remember Lucky's? Yes. Long time Vegas. We'd walk into the Lucky's, and she would have that coupon. And, uh, and I got to tell you, she made, the, she made the clerks and the managers nervous. She'd walk in, hold that thing up. People start backing away, you know, <laughs> hiding underneath the counter. <laughs> She's here, she's here, she's here. 
My mother walked in with a coupon one day. She said, Josh, you want to go to the store with me? I said, sure, why not? I'm 13 years old. I got nothing better to do. I walked in, and, and I was already embarrassed walking into the store because I was 13, and 13-year-olds are embarrassed about everything. And then she holds up the coupon. She walks right over to the peanut butter aisle. She arrives there. She had a triple coupon for peanut butter, and she did the calculation at home. She believed she could get the price of the peanut butter to nine cents per jar. Nine cents per jar. This is insane. So she goes in. She walks up. She looks at the aisle. She looks at the thing. She takes all of them down. There were only about 12 or 13 of them. She put them in the cart. And I knew what came next. She knew what came next. She looked over at me. I looked up at her. I said, go get the manager. She said, go get the manager. I went over. I said, is there a manager available? Manager comes out and says, is it your mom? Yeah, let's go. So we walked right over to the aisle. Manager knew her. I'm here for more peanut butter. She said, ma'am, that, he said, ma'am, that's all the peanut butter we have. She said, how much do you have in the back? He said, I'll go check. He walked into the back, and hand to God, he comes out with a crate. A, a crate of this peanut butter. I wish I could say it was the good peanut butter. It wasn't. It was the healthy peanut butter. You know, with the nuts at the bottom and the oil on top, you have to stir it yourself. It's the healthy stuff. I don't want the healthy stuff. Give me Jif. Give me Peter Pan. Give me the stuff that gives you cancer. You know what I'm talking about? That's the peanut butter that I want. I don't want the healthy stuff. I know I'm going to heaven. You know what I mean? Like, just, I want to be happy on the way. So she said, here we go. I knew what was happening. She says, start loading up. I grabbed a cart. We had a cart. We started loading it up. She filled the full cart all the way to the top. Second cart, we got nearly to the top. We grabbed both of these carts. We start heading toward the aisle. Nine cents a jar. We sat there for 25 minutes. Ding, 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 ding. My mom's just sitting there like, she the queen of luckies. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm just like, I hate peanut butter, you know. Walk we finally get home. We actually put it all in the trunk. This I remember clearly. We drove in a 1978 Buick LeSabre. And as we drove, the back of the trunk scraping across the ground as we got home has so much peanut butter, and we had to load it up in a particular cabinet. We had a pantry with a specific cabinet. We had to load all the peanut butter up, and I looked at it. It's glorious. Look at all this peanut butter. I had peanut butter for years, years worth of peanut butter, tons of peanut butter. I had peanut butter waffles for breakfast and peanut butter sandwiches for lunch. She put peanut butter in the casserole for dinner. It was disgusting. <laughs> Ate it every... We would have friends come over, me and my siblings. We'd have friends come over to play video games. They would leave, and my mother would be like, would you like to take home some peanut butter? Kids are walking home in the neighborhood with peanut butter. <laughs> and it's disgusting. It was really gross. We had more peanut butter than we could ever handle, more peanut butter than we could ever use. And because we had more peanut butter overflowing out of our house, we gave it away every chance we get. Friend, don't you understand? Some of you as Christians have such a difficult time giving somebody a little bit of mercy, giving somebody a little bit of forgiveness, giving somebody a little bit of love. What are you doing? Your pantry is so packed, full of love, mercy, and forgiveness. You should be giving it away. This is the way the kingdom people are supposed to be. And it can be the way you live. It changes the entire dynamic because no longer do you live upside down. See, you begin living right side up in an upside down world. This is part one. We've got two to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the chance you've given us to study it today. And oh God, I pray that you would help us to change based upon what we see in your text. Lord, I pray that we would not allow temporary things to distract us. I pray, Father, that we would win through love and generosity. And I pray that wherever we go, we would represent you to the world around us. God, I pray that we would live differently in a world that is so corrupt so that we can point people to you and the salvation you offer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Josh Tice's most recent Bible sermon. If you think of someone who may enjoy this one, go ahead and send it or post it today. If you're ever in Las Vegas on Sunday, we'd love for you to stop by Southern Hills and see us in person. If you benefit from this virtual ministry, we'd also like to encourage you to support our gospel efforts by sending a donation to the ministries of Southern Hills. 
You can do so by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab.